How is your Lent? Do you have to cut sugar, pancakes, everything that is nice? If we really know what Lent is about, we'll have no problem with fasting. Do you have to stop eating for 40 days? Is Lent an opportunity just to become fit? If you really need to know what Lent is about, don't miss our next episode of Salve Maria, the podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. In this chapter, all you need to know about Lent. Welcome to episode number nine of Salve Maria, the podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. Today we are with Father Arthur Lebnikian, with Brother Justin Bonian. We always are with Father Arthur Lebnikian and Brother Justin Bonian. But uh, today makes it special because we have a program dedicated to Lent. And we basically are trying to establish everything you need to know about Lent. Right, Father Arthur? Absolutely. It's an extremely important moment of the uh, life of the Church and of our lives, because uh, Lent is the preparation for the accomplishment of our salvation. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to the world for Lent. He came to the world to prepare himself, to offer himself to the Father on our behalf. And in Lent is the moment in which we unite ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's an extremely important moment of, of the life of the Church. Now, we have some issues sometimes as well, with, like, like with confession and the other program, that uh, many of our contemporaries, our Catholics that are there, um, many times we have an issue um, with different aspects so that we get uh, somehow sidetracked no, during Lent. And sometimes there are some practices, there are some concerns, and today we wanted to make clear no, that those, those concerns, those maybe misconceptions about Lent no, can be clarified. Right? So there are so many people around that are Catholic. So last time, uh, you remember you know, in the coffee shop, my, my cousin sent us this, uh, this, this video about you know, some of his clientele. And, but now I have another cousin who has a dental practice. And some of his patients also express themselves sometimes about religion, and especially on the topic of Lent. So let's hear a little bit what's going on in the dental practice. Hi. Hello. How can I help you? I'm here to see Dr. Jones for my appointment today. Yes. And your name? Uh, J. Cool. J. Cool. Oh, yes. Uh, 3.30 p.m., correct? You yes. Are, you are here for a regular checkup. Yes. Uh, I had my uh, root canal three months ago. Absolutely. Um, you're a bit early and Dr. Jones is running behind the schedule, but he will be with you shortly. Perfect. Okay. 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 Please have a seat. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I could. Hello, Hi. how can I help you? Yes, I'm uh, Joe Gray. My wife called this morning. Uh, oh. Sorry, uh, I have a broken tooth. She took an appointment for me. Yes, yes. Um, <sighs> Dr. Jones will try to squeeze you in between appointments. Okay. So please be patient and sit down. Have I'll try. I'll have, try. Thank have a seat. Okay, please. okay. He will be with you. Okay. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Hello, Joe. Hey, what yeah. happened? Jay, how are you doing? Bad. You look oh, bad. I'm so much in pain. Oh, I cannot sleep for 10 minutes. Kids screaming, my mother-in-law, my job. I have a broken tooth. Nice way to start Lent. Oh man, my mouth is falling apart already. And I have to fast? <laughs> Fasting for what anyway? So Father, here we go. Fasting for what anyway? Because sometimes people just tend to completely focus only on the problem of fasting. And let's start by there, because Lent, in the end of, of everything, is not just about fasting, correct? Absolutely. Fasting is a mean for a goal. Fasting is to prepare yourself for something that you want to do, you want to unite yourself spiritually with our Lord Jesus Christ. So our Lord Jesus Christ came to save us, and uh, we are guilty because we, we have original sin, we, uh, we are not... Uh, good, we're sinners, so he came to save us. So therefore, we prepare ourselves to receive the salvation by offering something of us. So we can offer actually three things. We can offer prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Prayer is 
something of the soul that you offer something of, of your spirit. Fasting is something of the body that you do uh, of yourself. You do a sacrifice in order to offer this sacrifice and unite yourself somehow with our Lord Jesus Christ who did the great sacrifice. And then we have almsgiving, which is something that you do for the others. It's something that, that you are offering for the good of the others, that you, you are offering something of yourself for the others. Are there any guidelines about fasting, some things that we should be doing, some things that we don't have to do? How, how would that be? Because, for instance, our patient there, no, he has already no, a broken tooth, and now he's saying, and now I have to fast? Is that draconian, uh, our Catholic Absol religion? Absolutely. People don't know what, is, what, is fasting, uh, what fasting is all about. Actually, fasting is very simple. Extremely fasting, simple. Fasting is only some days in, uh, in Lent. Hmm? We're not looking at a Ramadan. Right? No. Where you go, you know, a period of time with, of, of no food or no water or what have you. It's, it's actually rather laxed. Our Western fasting rules are very lax okay. compared to um, rules that were in place in the past, but also compared to some of the Eastern churches. It's, we're actually pretty, pretty easy off. So on the days of fast, we can have one normal meal. Normal. Like a lunch. Normal meal what you normally would eat, and the two secondary meals cannot equal the one. Mm -hmm. So it's, you're, you're left with a little bit of hunger, but you're not starved, right? And that's a big issue. Um, the other one is water, right? For example, if you need to take medication, water is always permitted no matter what. But it's, there's no limitation on it. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a misconcept. It's... It's a confusion that is spread, unfortunately, through media and through word of mouth. Uh, at times, word of mouth is your worst enemy. And how many days of fasting do we have, actually? Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Those two. are fast yeah. and abstinence. Now, mm -hmm. abstinence um, are obligatory during Lent. Mm -hmm. But outside of Lent, although the Catechism mentions there are days of, of, uh, of sorrow, of, of penance, we can exchange it for another penance of our choosing on other Fridays throughout the year. But during Lent, we should really abstain from meat. And if we don't have a good reason not to, uh, it could be a sin. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But also fasting doesn't mean specifically food, no? Because we can also apply it to some things that we would like mm -hmm. to do and we go for because in the end of the story we offer a sacrifice no exactly. and if we if we're just going to think about you know culinary what <laughs> limitations no 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 it should be also something that we offer as a real sacrifice as an act of penance as an act of reparation probably right exactly you have to sacrifice things that uh, uh, are not good hmm? uh, and also you have to sacrifice even things that are good but you want to offer them things that, that are legitimate. For example, let's say sleep. Huh? You can, during Lent, then offer some sleep to, uh, to our Lord Jesus Christ. Wake up earlier, uh, sleep less, etc. Uh, and you can, uh, you can offer um, some work. You can offer them uh, uh, helping people in, in, their, in their needs. Uh, uh, there are many ways. The corporal and spiritual acts of mercy are a good guide to figure out extra things that we can do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Very good. So basically we can say that fasting is something Catholic, no? that we offer, but we offer out of love. No, We don't offer out of an empty uh, what usage and no? things like that. I think one thing that is important throughout um, Catholic morality is the God gave us free will, but he also judges our intentions. What is mm. our intention when we're doing this action? God knows our intention. So when we give up something, we do it with the idea of for the greater glory of God, for the salvation of souls, offering it for the souls in purgatory, offering it for my cousin, my niece, my nephew, my grandson, whatever the case is. The intention, God knows what the intention is. Now, if we're, if we're doing this to slim down, what's our intention? Purity of intention is very important. Exactly. Then we end up with the Pharisees, no? Everybody just finding external you know, ways to skip the law and then still no. continue doing the same things, but at least we you know, abide by the, by the letter. Yes. And that's legalism. 
And that is something that St. Paul condemns very strongly in his letters. And that is wrong because there's no love of God there. Exactly. So basically the intention, as you, as you mentioned, is extremely important. It doesn't matter so much what you do, but the intention with what you, you do it. So the highest intention you have, the most value in the eyes of God, you know, the act that you are doing um, uh, acquires. So uh, you have to offer the, um, the sacrifices for the glory of God. It's an idea of giving up something for the love of God. Exactly. Right? For the conversion of sinners, for the restoration of, uh, of goodness in the world, you know. For um, uh, so many important uh, intentions that, that you can have, reparation for, for so many are, sins, exactly. Sins that are committed. And also but other sins, be, no? But it has to be an intention, right? It just can't be yeah. a, this blanket thing. No. So, for example, you you hear about something very bad that happened, something horrible that, that some, some people did. For example, there was a terrible abortion done uh, recently in, in, in a Catholic uh, hospital in, in Montreal. Montreal. Mm. So we, when you hear something like this, you want to offer a sacrifice in reparation, in reparation. to Lord Jesus Christ. In the same way that he himself, Lord Jesus Christ, offered himself in reparation to God the Father because, our sin, because of our sins, then you imitate Lord Jesus Christ, offering something of you because of the sins of the others. Very I, good. I yes. use something to sound a little point here when we're talking with children to help them understand what this is. I say, imagine if you have a friend who has been greatly uh, offended somehow, and you are a good friend. You go and try to help them feel better, right? Mm -hmm. you, you do something for them to help them. In the same way, we should be friends of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the friends of exactly. the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and we should be that type of, of friendship in which we go and we try to console them with the little that we can do. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Okay, but um, there in the dental, dental office, we still have some more things going on because apparently there are some more issues that need to really be clarified. Come on, Joe, you don't have to fast like a monk. Chill, relax. Chill, relax? What do you mean by relax? I can't even get a glass of water at home. It's my mother-in-law and this Lent thing. She's impossible. She cut everything. Sugar, salt, pancake, coffee, everything. She wants me on bread and water. So what, I can't have the meat for 40 days now? Nah, chill. Life is easy. It's about taking a nice break, relaxing. All you have to do in Lent is cut coffee and chocolate. Lent is all about taking care of yourself. Going to the gym, intermittent fasting, eating sugar, Obviously, avoiding the chocolate. You always have to avoid the chocolate. It's easy. You know, for me, Lent is about health, mindfulness, and relaxing. After all, that's what religion stands for. Just feel good. So, Father, is religion about just feeling good? And how does Lent come into the picture? <laughs> I think that feeling good is just the opposite of religion. <laughs> Actually, mm. It's exactly the opposite because... Uh, Religion is your relation, from, it comes from Latin, religare, you are related to, is your relation to, to God, in which you unite your, yourself to God in whatever he is doing. When we consider, you know, the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is Lent, there's a preparation for, for this, so then, therefore we are uniting ourselves with his passion. And uh, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ didn't do this to feel good. <laughs> Obviously, you know, it was the, the last thing that he was thinking about was to feeling himself good. He was offering everything for, for the Father. So to feel good is just the opposite of being a religious person. We need to make reparation, as we were saying no, in the, in the, in some moments ago, right? It's, it's a matter of feeling how God is unfortunately offended, and many times by us, not by, other, by someone else, no, by us. No, we absolutely. have done things that were wrong, and now we need to, to offer. No? The, the line from the Eastern liturgy, you know, uh, forgive me for I am a sinner, and of sinners I am first, right? That, that point is to, when it comes to sin and sinfulness, we should look at ourselves as the worst sinner. 
um, not look at others, look for others to be the sinner in that sense. We should look towards and have that clean conscience in which we look at ourselves and say, beat our chest and say, we are sinners and we need to fix that. But hopefully we have the good intention, which we want to fix it. Exactly. Because for, for yourself, you are the worst sinner. Absolutely. It doesn't mean in, in absolute terms that you are the worst sinner in the world. It could be other people who are much worse. But you don't compare yourself to them. You're comparing yourself to God. But when you're judged, it doesn't matter about the, the let's say, the, no. the greatest sinner. Exactly. It's exactly. you. It's your moment of exactly. light, right? Exactly. And if you, if you don't come up to what you're supposed to be, you fail. Who cares about the other? Who really cares? In absolutes, it doesn't make a difference. Absolutely Your not. relationship with Christ is you and Christ. It isn't your neighbors. So, but, you, yeah, sorry. No, you're not trying to, to, uh, uh, to diminish your guilt. In the contrary, because you have offended such a good being as the Lord Jesus Christ, such a good person, he's a divine and human person, you have offended him. Your offense is infinite. Yeah. So you want to give an infinite reparation. So there's nothing that can uh, be enough. But you can't achieve that. You can never achieve that. No, you can't. And that's why the idea of, of salvation by our works, that we somehow can pay our own way, is ridiculous to even think about. And in the church, has never been the case. Um, we, we're fully dependent on God, God's grace. Absolutely. It's not by following the, uh, the law that you're going to be saved, as St. Paul says. It's by accepting the redemption that came from our Lord Jesus Christ. But the law helps us to fulfill that. Without the law, you don't achieve it. Exactly. exactly. That's where the dichotomy is. Some people like to cut that off and say, you don't need the laws. We do free form. Free form religion. Religion without rules and without... Anything. I'm, I'm, not no, sure, I'm, I'm not sure where to go with that, but it's how like... Many, how many no. times you have heard this? No, okay, take advantage of Lent. So it's going to be a nice break. You lose a little bit of weight, right? You cut on some sugar. You cut the chocolate. We're going to see why. Anyway, and then we're going to see, you know, we're going to go to the gym, right? And then we're going to do That's these things. That's your penance. Your penance is to go to the gym. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, you know, gym, losing weight, <laughs> nice break. But how empty this is, no? Because we are not f showing a, a contrite and humble heart. The God of that religion is yourself. It's egoism. You are the, you're the God. Huh? It's, cent exactly. it's centered on you. Exactly. It's, it's basically Buddhist. You're adoring the God who is yourself. Precisely. Exactly. But we also have some people that also go to the other extreme, no? I mean, the, the mother-in-law here in concrete, no? The poor fellow is, is saying, no, but no, my mother-in-law, I mean, cuts, cuts the sugar, cuts, the, cuts, cuts everything right at home and makes life impossible. So we need to be Catholic about that, no? At the same time, we need to offer a humble and contrite heart but with a balance. No. The mother-in-law is, is a little bit like a Pharisee. She's uh, looking only for the, the, the concrete things and not the intention and the reason that is behind. She's forgetting that uh, the most important thing is to, uh, to educate the others to understand why you should suffer for a religious crime. Things shouldn't become a police estate. You know, now you're going to be at the door exactly. and say, how, many, what, how, many, how much sugar did you eat today? No, no. Precisely. But if you look at it, she's going to do that because she's scared of what the neighbors are going to say if you do that, right? Mm -hmm. So if you leave the house with a, a Danish in your mouth or in your hand, then the neighbors are, what are the neighbors going to think? Yeah. But that's not Christian. That's not, why are you, why are you putting yourself to this discipline is for the greater glory of God. Exactly. It's religion according to what the others are going to think. And that's no. not religion. <laughs> and that's not that's the Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Brother Justin, at the same time, many people, and you hear this, no? Sometimes in very so-called spiritual circles, no? Yeah. I need to be fed. And that's somehow good, but also has another side to it that is not that Catholic, correct? Well, the problem is, is that the person in their journey of life they are, we're always trying to have a process of conversion, of turning back to what mm -hmm. we were called to be, right? Calling, being called back to Eden, called back to heaven. And the problem is, is that our first stage of conversion is we encounter our sinfulness and we're overwhelmed with consolation and, and super abundant graces and everything. And that brings us into a second stage in which we begin to see ourselves making progress. We start... Um, kicking some of the bad habits, we start we start making real motion, but we still feel really good, right? And everything is like energized and en energy and feeling good and the dopamine's there and everything is great. The key is, is that for us to really begin to make 
uh, progress, real progress, we have to reach this third conversion in which we don't get the constellations. We don't get that warm, fuzzy feelings. It's more aridity. It's more difficult. It's, it, it, it is harder. It's a maturation, right? We need to... Very much. The attachment to, to, to constellations. And, and, to... and the problem is, is that a lot of... And then you have to... But the key about the third stage is that it's about giving of self. You start giving thoroughly of oneself. You, you start being the pelican. And you start tearing from yourself to feed others. Now, that's not a comfortable position. That doesn't feel good. There's no dopamine hit for this. No. You're being misunderstood. Your friends don't like you. Uh, every, everything is darkening a bit. It's more difficult. And it's important for us because God's grace is, is there. Super abundant graces are still present. But we need to carry our cross. And for a lot of people, they can't. They don't want to do this. And they... They, they veer away from this third level, this higher level, and they like to stay in the second. And it's like I need the to drug addiction. constantly, right? Need yes. To receive, receive, Always receive, about receive. the others doing me, for you. Me. Always being fed by you. So it's who is the center of their spirituality? It's themselves. Exactly. And if it's Eucharistic adoration, it's themselves that's being adored. And unfortunately… It's what Joe says, no? Don't, don't, don't think about yourselves. Think about me. It's all about you. No, you are the center. But unfortunately, we see that a lot within these uh, quote-unquote praise songs that are, that are sung in churches. And if you listen to the words, it's not about Christ. It's not about heaven. It's not about the Trinity. No, no. It's about me, Lord. I am here okay. to adore you. Listen, listen. I'm here. <laughs> I am the one. Uh, no, 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 don't listen to the rest of them. It's me. It's all about me. And that is a weird, perverse form of pride, which, which, is, which is going to stunt your growth. And it's going to stop you from arriving at this third level, which is where you really become a friend of God. Or as St. Louis Montfort would say, a, a friend of the cross. A friend of the cross. And then, and then you are really happier because you are giving Real happiness, you know, the, 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 uh, the world today understands happiness in a totally wrong way. Happiness is to give, not to receive. Yeah. So, of course, you want to receive, but in order to give. If you want to receive to keep it, then, you know, it's useless. It's like a meal with, with, without protein. It's just sugar and, uh, and puffy pastries. Um, it's going to dull in your, your mm. taste. And a lot of people who end up falling away, if you look at their lives, they arrived at that second stage. They got addicted to this, 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 this element of this sugary experience, and they were unwilling to give to others, to grow in that way, and they became bored. Why did they become bored? Because it is boring. <laughs> so to summarize this, this I think this act you know, in, in, in our conversation, in the end, you know, Lent is about being friends of the cross. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and not being egocentric and just looking for consolations and feeling good. I no, think that's... in a scenario, a scenario of Lent, where we have Christ on the cross, we want to find ourselves as St. John or Our Lady, quiet there to give solace to our Lord. Beautiful. We're not going to stand in front and go, hey, Lord, clap my hands, look at me, I'm here. I made it here, look at me. That has no place. And so in Lent, Our Lady of Sorrows, pray for us, right? Pray for us. <laughs> but Father, Brother Justin, there are still some more things happening at the dental office. So I think we could take another look because there are very important points of view to be debated still. Feel good, feel good. It's easy for you to say that. You don't have a broken tooth. Ouch. Everyone does the same. Instead of thinking about yourself, think about me. <laughs> Joe, oh, chill, relax, take it easy. That's because you don't live at my home. Lent for them is all about going to church, going to confession, cutting all the good stuff, and making life impossible. But you have it tough. Yeah, plus every Friday they go to that boring thing. Which one? You know the one uh, they go and they go from picture to picture with the cross and numbers? Numbers, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Oh. So. We were saying about Lent, you know, how Lent is also about prayer. And apparently people had issues there with, you know, that those little stations of the cross with the numbers on top. But we could clarify a little bit Lent <laughs> and prayer, you know, how important it is. 
You know, the first prayer that Mary did after the death of our Lord Jesus Christ was the way of the cross. She is the first one to do it in history, and she did it in the exact place where our Lord Jesus Christ had been. And she went place by place, remembering all the stations of the cross. Daily, no? Daily. And then she took it to, even to Ephesus. Uh, and from there, you know, the devotion uh, continues till today. So it's extremely important to remember everything that happened in, the, uh, in that passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the church has uh, produced what we call the 14 stations. Of course, there are even more stations than the 14 stations. And the, uh, the, the, the most important moments of that, uh, of that passion. And there are two stations that are very nice to consider, which is number five and number six. Number five is um, when uh, Simon helps our Lord Jesus Christ to carry the cross. And this actually brings us to the, you know, the heart of Lent. You know, it's so it beautiful. Is. Passion. Passion. Exactly. Because passion story. Simon was doing his Lent. I mean, he's the one who really did Lent. Uh, he was there to help our Lord Jesus Christ personally. And he represents all of us. Simon represents all the Christians till the end of the, of, of the world, helping our Lord Jesus Christ to carry his cross. It means that our Lord Jesus Christ felt that he, um, he didn't want to carry the cross only himself. He wants to invite us to participate in this glory, in this tremendous honor of carrying the cross of the salvation of, of the world. So he uh, kind of invited Simon, and it is told that he was coming from Cyrene, a place that nobody knows where it is. We don't know anything about somewhere Cyrene. Libya, I Libya. think. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. lost somewhere there. But you, you can I mean, imagine he just happened the scene, to no? encounter. He just happened, he's, he's happened coming, to and all of a sudden, he jumps into history. Now he's... Yeah, He's carrying precisely. the cross of the Savior with... <laughs> he, he jumps into the center of history, yeah. he, he, in, in, the, in the, the main um, acts of history, and uh, he is asked to carry the cross, as we are asked to carry the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says yes. He could have said something else. Of course. Because everyone was jeering and insulting our Lord at this point, throwing stones and other things. He would have joined them in the mockery. It would have made more sense yeah, because... exactly. Why would he make himself a shield for a man he doesn't know? I read one commentary that was kind of interesting on this point, which it said, it says there, they tell about his sons mm -hmm. in, the, in the biblical text, which is proof that not only does he encounter Christ along the way, but his, he finds salvation at that moment because his family joins the Christian community. And he's one of the proofs of it all happening. Apparently he had two sons, and the two sons became uh, disciples. Hmm. And he, of course, he's in heaven. Oh, no, Simon, no there's no doubt. So he, he realized that our Lord Jesus Christ was in him all the goodness of the world. And all the evil of the world was, was, uh, was chastising um, the uh, goodness. And he took the right side. He decided to, to take, I'm going to take the good side. I'm going to help this man. Which means that he actually, through his life, had been corresponding to graces. Exactly. Because it doesn't just happen. People think this big things happen and people just turn out good. He said yes many times in very small things. And when the big opportunity came, that was his moment. Of course. This is the crowning of his life. He could have, it would have been far easier, according to Anne Catholic Emmerich, um, all of hell was present tormenting our Lord. Yeah. Perse uh, it was a persecution. It's a fulcrum of hate. <laughs> he could have very easily, if he had not had a strong spiritual life, would have just faltered. But you see you know, how exactly. important it is, the meditation of all the, all the different moments of the Passion, and how they enrich our, our Lent. Absolutely. That it gives a lot of meaning. No, to, to... And now you have the next one, number six station, because uh, number five is a man. And he is going to help physically mm -hmm. our Lord Jesus Christ to carry his physical cross. Now, in station number six, you're going to have a woman. And she's going to help also our Lord Jesus Christ to carry his cross, but in a different way, in a spiritual way. She is going to, uh, to wipe out the tears that came from the pain of the soul of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, seeing that he was being so much rejected in unjustly. And she, she feels, she communicates her heart with the heart of Jesus 
and uh, she wants to console him. And as a reward, the Lord Jesus Christ does a miracle because he's so much touched, you know, by this woman that uh, wants to console himself. She cannot do anything because she, 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 what could she do? I remember reading somewhere that what she did was so heroic because culturally mm -hmm. speaking, a woman had no place in that setting. Exactly. No place. And to she touch had, a man. She and... encountered the public, this mm -hmm. throng of people. She cleans his face. Imagine what else had been thrown at Jesus. Exactly. Right? I mean, it's, it's interesting just to, wait, wait. He had been defiled. He had been the most wretched way. And she cleans him with her own cloth. And did she know him? Again, question is, did she know him? She might have. Maybe she didn't. Maybe she was like Simon. She encountered in that, that moment of encounter with our Lord. What does she do? She offers pity. She offers exactly. compassion, charity. But also, you know, the word cross for an educated person of the time was to be completely avoided oh. because of the horrendous Horrible. implications the that the cross has. I mean, it's, it was, it was, no, I mean, a person who, who, who was civilized, a person who had some form of education would even avoid talking about crosses. No, no. Crucifixion? And, no. And they would run away from the man who'd been crucified. Oh, yes. they would run away. Oh, no, no, for certain. But Veronica, no. Veronica, she, she goes to, to him and somehow she gets close to him, which is extraordinary, as you just mentioned. And uh, she wipes out, out her, her face. She gives that consolation. And our Lord Jesus Christ has a beautiful way of rewarding her because he didn't have anything to give her. No. What could he, he give her? Nothing. So what does he do? He prints his face on her cloth, on, 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 the, on the, um, the veil, on the beautiful veil that is preserved till today. And his image, uh, it's imprinted in her veil. And not only that, but in her soul, oh. the image of our Lord Jesus Christ is printed, much more important even than the, the, the veil. And forever, Vero Icono, her name became Vero Icono. Apparently, that was not her original name, but she's known in history because of this fact. And uh, she, she took Vera her icon, the true image. No, the true image, yeah. Vero Icono. Hmm? I heard that one of the reasons was because it was sort of like a nickname amongst the Christian community. Yeah. She was the one that the Lord gave his image, her Im the image to. So it was like, that was like a m moment of glory, right? You, uh, this is Peter. This is the rock that church is going to be built on. And this is the one that the Lord gave the image to. So that's something amazing. Well, we just touched beautiful, beautiful. two stations in the past 10 minutes almost. We almost just, just touched the surface of station number five, Absolutely. the surface of station number six. So how Absolutely. prayer is at the center of land and how we can enrich all these 40 days no, of, of preparation and also reach, going towards the Holy Week because Holy Week is the peak of everything. No? So when you know these things, then yes, you want to fast. <laughs> then yes, you, you, you want to sacrifice, uh, to sacrifice, you, you want to give cross. to the others. <laughs> of course. But where does the l desire to fast come from? It comes from love. Yeah. Without love, it's nothing. It's nothing. And I think that's the major problem that our friends have in the, in the dental office, which is that they're afflicted with a disease. Mm -hmm. The disease is indifferentism. They're indifferent. Brother Justin, let's go back there and see what else is happening. Because I think at this point, the question of, you know, being indifferent is really running quite rampantly there. Let's go and take a look. Nah, Joe, relax, chill. Who needs church? Who needs Lent? I'm a good person already. See, I told you. I support my local animal shelter. I'm doing intermittent fasting. I meditate. I practice gratitude. The only thing you have to worry about is cutting sugar and chocolate. Chocolate is the bad thing, huh? That stuff is perverse. Well, wow. it's gonna send you you know where, huh? Just be careful with the chocolate. Mm. Besides that, I'm a spiritual person already, anyway. Mm. Who needs organized religion? So there we go. I am a spiritual person already, right? And uh, I don't need organized religion. And this is something many, many of our contemporaries talk about. And quite a mistake, no? Because if it were like that, why did our Lord come? And also, why did he give us sacraments? Why did he give us the liturgy, right? Why he creates the world with everything, like sun, day and day and, and, and night, the seasons, as a reason for a liturgy, as a reason for... So, I mean, there are so many meanings. You really don't need any organized religion. How do we, how do we see that? Religion is something that 
necessarily has to be organized, necessarily has to be in order, because it's everything organized in order of our Lord Jesus Christ. To want a disorganized religion is, is like wanting a, a, a disorganized order. Which doesn't exist. It's ridiculous. Disorganized is completely opposite. To, or maybe to we want religion. to avoid any form of accountability. Exactly. That's more of the issue. Mm, no. The question is this, is that was our Lord a part of a religion? Or did he trailblaze on his own? The answer is... He was. He was. <laughs> of course. He was a very observant Jew. Right? John the Baptist. Was he just a hippie... Uh, Hippie hanging out in the desert. He was a part of probably the most, one of the most Arditi groups. Exactly. Right? Most observant. So, I mean, it's important that we look at that because I think many people kind of look at with a very uh, soft gaze and they just go, well, they don't, they didn't have these rules. No, no, they had rules that were far more demanding. So, all the saints, what did they do? They organized their life in, fun in function of Lord Jesus Christ. So, if you don't want to organize your life, in, in accordance with the Lord Jesus Christ, then, then you're not a saint. I mean, you're never going to get but there. But what does saint mean? <laughs> saint means a friend of God. But in the end yeah. of the story, and here it goes, no, we, we want to be indifferent to the figure of our Lord Jesus Christ, yes. indifferent to the commandments, indifferent to... You would be more or less on the way, you know, with Simon of Cyrene and Veronica doing those heroic actions. You'd be someone on the side um, eating ice cream while all this horror is happening, I'm not involved. Exactly. I'm neither throwing... <laughs> I'm a good person already. I'm a good person. I'm not involved. I don't believe in organized chaos or I don't believe in this... this nah, but this I'm not going to help. Dialogue. No. I, I will want, not help. I want to enjoy my life. I'm enjoying my ice cream. My ice cream. And that's it. I, I, I don't care what's going on. I with a lot of I'm not getting involved. I'm not getting involved. So, I mean, that, that, I think the key element here is that uh, when we look at... Uh, I think it's St. Thomas says this... Um, the opposite of love, right, is indifference. Because in hatred, there is still love. There's still a reflection. When a person truly loves, they also hate. So it goes back and forth. But when you have an absence of love, the opposite is indifference. You are called to God. Yes. You, you have no reaction to God. And you know that Dante, when he describes the, the uh, uh, hell, inferno, in, uh, in the beginning, hell is very, very hot. But as it goes down and down and down, it becomes cold. It's ice cold. Why? Because the person is completely unrelated to God. And the person doesn't want to know about God. He's cold with God. And he's frozen. So the, the indifference is, in a certain sense, uh, such a horrible sin that it can be compared to somebody who is against the Lord Jesus Christ, and to be indifferent to the Lord Jesus Christ is more or less the same. Oh, but it's far worse. Or worse. At least if you, our Lord says this in Revelation, hot or cold, I will accept you. Lukewarm, I spit you out of my mouth. There is no solution for the lukewarm, because they're not interested, they're just not interested. So here we can tie up maybe, you know, indifference with, against generosity, because Lent is also about mm. generosity, it's about almsgiving, it's about giving something to the poor, something to the needy, and that places you immediately in a position of generosity and not of indifference. Also keep in mind that the generosity, the, the giving, the charity, must be for the love of God, right? For the, for the salvation of souls. It can't be just for the, the thrill of giving to the poor. I like to go and give to the poor as long as there's a paparazzi around me with their phones and they're putting me on Instagram, me giving, right? I like, to, like people thinking that I'm a good person. Or maybe not. Maybe we just justify our complete absence of, you know, love for other things and we just kind of pay, you know? Okay, you know, let me pay my, my conscience, right? So that through through giving, but that's not somehow charity. I hush my conscience. No, could be philanthropy, but it's not, yeah. not charity. Exactly, mm -hmm. I'm I'm trying to hide my indifference, and you know this indifference is very old. Huh? Already, the the Greeks in the third century, they have a, huh. a philosopher called Zeno of Citium, who invented Stoicism. So it was a a theory by which you should be indifferent to suffering. It doesn't matter if you you feel pleasure or you feel uh, pain, etc. You should be completely indifferent and try to continue your life without regarding the, the pain of yours and the others. You're indifferent to the others also. E Epicurus, 
Mm -hmm. of the Epicurean philosophy. He has something very similar, but his is even, uh, even funnier in a sense, yeah, yeah. in which he says that we should avoid <laughs> anything that causes pain. Exactly. So we should not be involved in politics because when we're amongst the police, they can demand things of us that we might have to give. So we should avoid it. We should avoid anything that causes us pain in any form. But isn't it funny, eh? because the Greeks had all of that. But nowadays, we have another version of the Greeks, which oh, well, is mindfulness. Yes. And mindfulness is spirituality without religion. No, and this is rampant among people. I mean, we were just forgetting Lent, forgetting the cross, forgetting Jesus, forgetting the gospel, forgetting everything else. And we have mindfulness. You rest in what? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what you're resting in, but I think you're resting in the God of self or a God of hedonism. The God of pleasure. And that pleasure doesn't have to be a positive pleasure. It can be an absence of pain or an absence of, of effort. So mindfulness is somehow a source of pleasure and nothing else then? You could say. Unfortunately, our society today, it produces indifferentism. Our society is meant to take people to have a complete disregard of what is going on with God complete disregard of salvation and everything. They just want to think about themselves and they're completely indifferent for the rest of the world. And that's why church has no place. No, exactly. Because I don't care, I don't care. about a, a salvation. I don't care. It's not, a, it's, it's not a philosophical argument. Is that I don't want it to be. It's, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm intellectually very weak and very lazy. I just don't want it. And that problem brings us to what we have now. We have the nuns, right? I don't believe in anything. Why? Because it gets in the way. It's a fasting, the fasting growing. No, the fastest, 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 fastest growing amongst Generation Z and um, everything. All the other, generation X. And it, but it's, 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 it's a sort of a, a laissez-faire. Just, just, I don't care. The, the I don't care religion today, I think it's the greatest religion in the world. Oh, no, I think it is. <laughs> For sure. much more it than crosses all religion. cultural lines. Oh, of course, of course. And if, from an animist all the way to a Catholic, they're all members of yeah, this of religion. The, of, of another religion, which is the real religion that, that It's that the people, true one. It's the, the one, one that you, you, the people truly really follow. So, but in the end of the story, doesn't this conduct to hypocrisy? Um, excuse me, Mr. Gray. Dr. Jones will see you now. Please come in. Oh, that's great. Hey, Jay, good seeing you, okay? Have a good one. Thanks, you too, hey. By the way, take care of yourself, chill, relax. And remember, Lent is about cutting calories, the sugar, and the chocolate. Okay, remember that, huh? Bye, Joe. Have a great Lent, but chill. And remember, you can always indulge in something. Maybe just a bit. Incredible, eh? Sometimes we can see that after so much mindfulness, after so much, you know, don't touch that chocolate because it is evil, it is bad, it is, you know, the source of all evils. And then when the somebody's not, not looking, place for hypocrisy, right? Yeah. So we, we think that that, um, that Phariseeism has finished. <laughs> not at all. No, the <laughs> the extremely life. The Pharisees are not gone. They are just the Pharisees gone. never went away. <laughs> They're all over. And so the um, um, it's beautiful how, how Mary was the opposite of all, all of this. And Mary, she uh, she had seven great sorrows in her life, and she uh, she built her whole life according to them. And she took you know that uh, uh, that cross of our Lord Jesus Christ on her. Nobody has carried the cross as, uh, um, after our Lord Jesus Christ as Mary had done. What and a beautiful devotion for Lent to know this. But she was always meditating. Always, right? yeah. We have this question of this, you know, this mindfulness. She was mindful of what was important. Yeah. And that in, what was important was Christ. Yeah. And Christ who? Christ crucified. The, the words, I don't care, in Mary's mouth never, never went through. Never went through. So we have the seven sorrows. That uh, it's a very old devotion to Our Lady, in which uh, the faithful contemplate seven events of uh, of Mary that are extremely interesting, extremely important. They are all in the in the gospel. And uh, uh, the first one is when uh, when Simeon, the prophet, 
In the temple, at the presentation of the infant Jesus, Simeon will tell Mary that she will suffer also. And it will be so painful, it's going to be like a sword that will go through her heart. The pain of seeing her son being rejected mm. because, because he's good. And it's interesting yeah, because I think if, if you if, if you want to go through all the all the sorrows, no, all of them either go towards prayer, or towards fasting, or towards sacrifice in the end, fasting or almsgiving. Spiritual almsgiving. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. The second one is when uh, they had to fly to Egypt. A tremendous suffering. It was extremely difficult to uh, to travel. They had to go to the desert. The desert was full even of... Even nowadays, you can't do that. No, even nowadays. Uh, was full of, uh, of robbers, people that, that had nothing to uh, to do and to live from. So they, they, will, they will live on, um, on uh, stealing from people that were traveling. Uh, so it was extremely painful. Because it was painful for our Lord Jesus Christ, it was very painful for the, for the infant Jesus, very painful for Mary, the mother, who was carrying the infant Jesus during the, the whole trip. And, uh, and it was painful for St. Joseph because he didn't know where he was going. And he had this tremendous responsibility. He was, you know, running this family and he had to take care of this wonderful mother, but with God himself. He had to be the protector of, uh, of, uh, of God himself. And then... Uh, the third pain of Mary was uh, when she lost, when Jesus was 12 years old, approximately, she, they lost the inf uh, infant Jesus in the temple. And they didn't know where he, where he had gone. And they thought that it was their fault. And they had to go look for him. It's interesting. They're upright souls. So instead of them looking to blame someone else, they yeah. blame themselves. They blame themselves. Yeah. They weren't looking, they weren't blaming. It's not about, I am finger. a good person already. No? I'm a good person, I don't need, no, no, no. They fell upon themselves and they examined their own conscience. Exactly. And when they examined their conscience, they found out that they had nothing that was worthy to be rebuked of. And that's why Our Lady asked that famous question. Exactly, why? 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 Beautiful, it's beautiful. Because uh, Our Lady was going to, um, uh, to help people who also have lost Lord Jesus Christ, but because of, of something that uh, they have done wrong. So uh, the perseverance of Mary will help people to, to understand that you have to find Jesus in the temple. What does it mean? That you are going to find, find Jesus in prayer. Temple is the place of prayer, so you are going to find Jesus in the temple. By praying, Jesus will come back to you. Wonderful. The fourth is the uh, when Mary uh, uh, meets Jesus on the way to Cal uh, to Calvary. Oh, so, like encounter, no? Yes. Our lady with him. One of the stations, another station of the way oh. of the cross we're just talking about. So it's a beautiful moment in which the mother and the son, you know, uh, uh, look at each other and uh, we cannot imagine what went through uh, through the heart of each one of them. It's, what it's a source of meditation for Lent. Eh? How beautiful this is. How enriching. And then the, the whole family too, no? I mean, we can no, gather everybody, even the smaller ones, and then tell them the story, retell them. No? The fifth moment is when Mary was at the foot of the cross. And Mary is there and she's standing. You know? Stabat Mater, there's a beautiful hymn uh, in the Catholic Church. Um, Mary was standing at the, at the foot of the cross. <clears throat> so um, Mary was uh, accepting the offering that Jesus was doing at that moment. And she was participating in that tremendous redemption that the Lord Jesus Christ was gaining for mankind. Mary was there at the foot of the cross, and it is, it is in that moment in which she became our mother. The Lord Jesus Christ, uh, from the cross, she, he declares and, and he gives this kind of order to the mother that uh, this is your son, and this is uh, each one of us. And then the, um, the next moment is in which Mary re receives in her hands the dead body of her son. And uh, she, uh, she, she, he who is the author of life has no life anymore. And uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, his body, the only place where, where it could be is again in Mary. He came from Mary and he's going back to Mary. A beautiful uh, reflection that we can have, saying that also us, you know, everything that we do, everything that we are, comes from Mary and will come back to Mary. 
And the fourth, the, and the last one, the seventh one, is when the, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ is placed in the tomb. And the tomb is a place in which uh, everything finishes. It's kind of a, the final point of something, of a life. So Mary had to go through that moment, but knowing that it was not the final point, mm. because she knew that he was going to resurrect. And at that moment, she was the only one who had the, the whole face of the church was in her heart because the others were afraid, had, had gone away, and they thought that was the end. But Mary, no. Mary had the faith that is the faith that we need to, to have today, that regardless what going on uh, wrong around ourselves, we know that that's not the end. We know that the church will never end. We know that the church will, will always uh, grow and will, uh, will resurrect if necessary, without dying, of course. And that we are going to, uh, to, uh, to have it if we are united with Mary. Mary is the one who is going to give us the hope that we need today. So this summarizes pretty much you know, how the true Lent, you know, Lent is and what we need to know about Lent, everything we need. But also there are so many things to add to this. You know? But basically, in a nutshell, you know, I hope we help everybody who is listening to this the podcast today because seriously, you know, we need to focus Lent in on these three beautiful things, you know, prayer, fasting, almsgiving in the true Catholic way, right? And I think we could finish, Father, maybe in the true Catholic way as well, to bless everyone that, that is listening to us because of we're course. just in the beginning of, of Lent right now. No, I mean, we're about to start it soon. And what a good beginning. Eh? We want for each one of you a very blessed Lent because this is um, the, the great thing that you can have in your, in your life is to be united to the Lord Jesus Christ in his suffering. So the Lord be with you and, and with, with your, your spirit. spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.